So I got the Warriors next. Um, and they're a weird team to do this for because they've been so prominent for so long and they've been on so it's, it's everybody sort of has a rough idea of who does what um, because they're on, you know, the national stage more often than just about anybody. Um, I, I went with Gary Payton the second um, for a couple of, th- a couple of, re- well, one reason defense, but a, c- a couple aspects of that. Um, I think just anecdotally um, and we'll get to the numbers in a second, but I think he's the most disruptive on ball defender in the league. And there are guys like Patrick Beverly that come to mind in that regard, even though I, I think Patrick Beverly overrated because um, of all the fouling, um, you know, Marcus smart is another guy. I'm sure I'm forgetting several, but I think Peyton on the ball, it's just like a matter of if he's, if he comes in the game, the over under is like 45 seconds until he deflects a ball or like knocks it away from a dribbler. It just happens every time. It's like a joke. It, it, it's like a given. So, so that's the anecdotal case. Obviously he has the highest matchup difficulty on the team just because he, you know, if you have Jordan Poole and you have Steph Curry, neither of them is going to guard the other team's best offensive guard. It's always going to be Peyton. Um, There's some stats now because like just saying he creates havoc and has a hard job is one thing, but so he's Peyton is tied with Matisse Tybul for the league lead in deflections for 36, which is like Tybul is like an all timer ball deflector already like he's one of the best he's just like everywhere all the time his instincts are nuts and Peyton is as good as him per minute in in getting deflections so that that's kind of wild um that's among guys that have played 40 games offensively it's it's tough with Peyton like that's where maybe if you're saying he's underrated you sort of have to look away but he's a passable three-point shooter he's left open all the time for a reason but he's around the league average I think he's at like 36 percent last I saw um, those are all open corner threes, whatever. He's a super athlete. He He's a really good cutter from the corner. He gets a lot of duck-ins and dunks because his defender is always just like not looking at him. But still, you got to be opportunistic. Um, and advanced stats-wise, Raptor has him as the Warriors' third best player. Uh, estimated plus minus has him as the second best player. Not saying that's, I mean, you know. That's what you're take saying. That for what, take that's, that for, no take that for what it's worth. <laughs> but, but like – Hey, that's a good argument for him being underrated because nobody would even consider him as like in the top five or six on the team. Um, so uh, I, I think, I think he kind of fit, And he's also a guy that was basically out of the league, you know, and, and was in danger of being out of the league forever until landing in just the right spot that could, you know, make use of the stuff he's good at and hide the things that he's not. He is like Saran wrap on defense because it's just like, you can't get that stuff unstuck to you. If it's like, that's so hard to maneuver around. So he is, I think he is the right choice. The only other name I would consider here. And also sometimes I'll watch Gary Payton, uh, the second on offense. And I'll think, what if Russell Westbrook played that role on offense for the Lakers? Maybe they don't have the spacing to make it happen, but just his willingness to cut. We've seen him used in like screens. Uh, I know people have said like, what if Russell Westbrook played the Bruce Brown role? But it's almost like, what if he just played the Gary Payton second role? But that would, I guess, require also hustling on defense, which uh, is not something he does consistently. So I, I think the only other name here you could, or actually I'll make two cases. One is Juan Toscano Anderson. It would yeah. be very nice if he could hit a free throw or a wide open shot this season, but he's just a smart player. Keeps the ball moving on offense, knows how to not get in anyone else's way when he doesn't have the ball. And he gives you versatility on the defensive end. I am a sucker for JTA and I would love to see him get more consistent minutes with the dubs, like it feels like a lot of his playing time is sort of tethered to either how Steve Kerr's feeling that day or how many people are injured, but he has been, like, it's been a rough patch for him offensively. I think you can make the case and I'm not trying to galaxy brain this shit here. I promise. I think you can make the case that Steph is still underrated because I, and maybe this is recency bias, but I did an MVP ladder at Bleacher Report and people were mad that I had him fourth because he went through a slump or the Warriors were 500 or whatever the record was without Draymond Green, or he only had what was eight points against the Bucks. And I use this example. I don't know why I talked about it on the Easter. Oh, because we were talking about Drew Holiday. But I use this example. If you get a team like the Bucks to say that Drew Holiday's basically only job is going to be to face guard you and pay attention to nothing else that is happening, no one else commands that type of attention in the league. And he changes just the geometry of an offense by stepping on the floor, not by having the ball, not by moving just his existence. He could be standing in the corner and that changes everything. So 
I'm not here to say that he's actually underrated. He's a, he's an MVP. So I, I get it. I, I totally, he's the only unanimous MVP in NBA history, but I feel like there's still a lack of appreciation for what he does or a lack of nuance for his value, because it's not forget about the, like, yeah. Okay. They struggled without Draymond. Let's go see how the warriors look now that they're not going to have Steph Curry for at least a few weeks here. Um, they're probably going to be much worse. And that's just, I, it still blows my mind after all these years. And some of the arguments I think are designed to make people angry uh, where they say, you know, uh, he doesn't have a finals MVP. Like, and he had Kevin Durant and it's like, okay, but not it, so stuff like that I can throw out the window, but the fact that we can't look and, or some people can't look at the, just the MVP race. I'm not saying he should win. And maybe there was a case for him earlier on in the season, but to think that putting him in the top five this season when his team is still really good overall and he remains the primary reason why that still just blows my mind. So he's, he's not my pick. I would go with Gary Payton second or JTA, but he just like, he sort of had a case for the most improved player when he was the unanimous MVP. It feels like that type of a situation here to me. I think, I think the way I'd put it is, is he is the greatest scorer ever who impacts the game. If in, in a, in the most significant way of anyone on the floor, if he's like over 20, like it doesn't, it, then they're just, I just to, just to use an example, like, you know, a, a great, great scorers that are, that are good in other ways, like DeMar DeRozan, like best isolation scorer around right now, like that type of thing. If he's not scoring, it's not like it frees up stuff for other guys, like just Curry's presence and the way that he moves and the way that he's willing to do stuff off the ball. Um, it, it's just, it makes it. So yeah, to, to your point, the, the Bucks tried this Drew Holiday, you know, face guard thing and Curry did basically nothing except run around and get off the ball and, and, and just accept it. And the Warriors beat the defending champs by like 20. They were, they would, they boat raced them early. Like it was just over. And I don't know how it like, I don't know who else one gets that kind of treatment. Like you said, and two would have that be like kind of the predictable result because yeah, you're face guarding him, but all four other guys still are freaking out the second he has like a sliver of space. And there's just, there's just, there's just never been anyone whose best skill scoring can be bottled up and it still doesn't matter for how, or actually sometimes it has a positive effect on how well his team scores when he does. It's, it's a wild thing. Yeah. That, I, I take your point. Um, it's, it's hard, it's hard to encapsulate how great he is, you know, without, without sort of feeling like ridiculous because he has won two MVPs, but anyway, yeah, I like that. What, is there like a similar case to be made for Draymond? So like, I, well, sure. Because I think there are people that look at like, what is the average eight, seven and seven. And it's like, well, how good is this guy? Right. That's just such a, you know, we should, I hope nobody is listening to this that thinks that I hope, I hope we have like a little, uh, uh, I don't know, higher basketball IQ audience than that. Um, but defensively, like, yeah, he's kind of similar where, the, you know, the things that he does are hard to perceive, but I don't think there's any question to me. I, I still think he's the best defensive player in the league. And I like call, call me biased, but for DPOI, if he didn't miss time with the back stuff. Agree. Cause they were, the Warriors were the best defense by a considerable margin. And, and it's not like other than him, there's I any mean, Peyton sure, but he's like a low minute guy um, to get, to get that done with, you know, Curry playing a ton of minutes. He's passable. Um, pool is a bad defender still. And, and, you know, Kaminga doesn't know what to do half the time still. There's a lot of guys getting minutes that just aren't, 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 aren't great defenders. So yeah, I, I, green can be underrated in that regard too. I, I think, I think he just gets overlooked because he doesn't do things that, uh, you know, pop out in the, in the box score to use another super hack uh, take on him. To appreciate what he does in real time, you have to watch what's happening away from the ball. And for someone like me, and I try to fully admit this, just as someone who can't comprehend like the decision-making and real-time X's and O's of NBA basketball, you have to go back and watch things or read things about him. I think it was the, the breakdown he did with, was it Doris Burke on ESPN plus? I can't remember who he did it with, but I think it was Doris Burke. That was just exceptionally insightful. And I feel like that's probably where the discrepancy lies with this value. If you're only looking at the box score or, or expecting him, or you're watching the plays where you understand like, why are you passing up open opportunities at the rim? That like, those are the things that are going to resonate more in real time. So I think he does have a case there, but in terms of just like someone who can carry an entire team 
and the the rush to prove that he can't, Steph Curry still like sort of checks that box for me. But again, maybe I'm galaxy braining this shit, not the spirit of this exercise. 